Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Conceive, believe, achieve. Shut the f up. <laughs> You're listening to Believe You Me with Michael the Count Bisbing. You know my name yet? And Anthony Lionheart Smith. I said, so you just too big, haven't you? I think that's what's going on. Either that or my T-shirt is shrinking. I put a couple on this morning. I'm like, this is not too tight. I am not trying to be that guy, but I just think, I think they're shrinking. Jeez, I mean, I do wear these T-shirts a lot. Anyway, welcome to the show, everybody. You will notice that it isn't Anthony Smith. It's Mike Harrington. Good to see you, Mike. Thanks for being here. Anthony Smith is not here today. He was supposed to be. So don't all go crazy in the comment section. I know a lot of you are talking shit. Um, he's training for a fight. He's got a fight at UFC 301. And I believe Harrington, he spoke about this publicly, right? I'm not breaking news here. Yeah, he talked about it on uh, on Wednesday on his uh, Sirius XM show. And then, you know, a lot of the, the major MMA news publications ran with it over the weekend. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah, he's fighting Vitor Petrino, who is um, an undefeated fighter. He got a big win over Tyson Pedro a couple of weeks ago. He called out Anthony Smith for that fight. So fair play to Anthony. I mean... There's no easy fights in the UFC, but Vitor Petrino being undefeated, um, beating Tyson Pedro, you know, being a gigantic human being. He's a big, light heavyweight. He's a powerful striker. He's Brazilian, so you've got to assume that he's got good jiu-jitsu as well. Hold on. Let me look at my notes on my phone, and I'll tell you right now, the skinny on Vitor Petrino. This is what I do every time I commentate a fight. I have my notes section on my phone. I've just got every fight. Vitor Petrino, 11-0. Uh, goes on and on and on. We don't need this. Medesis Bukowskis knocked him out cold on the contender. Wild Brawl dropped him in one. Not too, Here's what I wrote. Not too technical. Massive power. Huge aggression. Round two, KO, left hook. So he's a big, strong, aggressive guy. Uh, so Anthony was going to do the, the podcast today. He drove to do his training camp in Denver, Colorado, I believe, at Factory X hit some insane traffic. It took him hours and hours and hours. So that's why he can't be here today. But he will be here on Mondays. And just so you all know, by the way, Mondays is Anthony Day. Thursdays is guest day. This Thursday, we got the one and only. Who did I say? We got Paolo Costa. And I think we might have Bo Nickel as well. Yes, sir. Paolo Costa, Bo Nickel, Harrington, and whoever else we can drag in as well. I think we've got three guests, actually, for Thursday lined up. Anyway, so let's talk about that off the top because UFC 301, of course, the next one coming up is 300. So I can't wait for that one. I think I'm working with Anthony on the desk. Me, Anthony, Brendan Fitzgerald. I think that's the lineup. So that'll be fun. Um, but the big news right now, UFC 301, we also not have we not only got the return of Anthony Smith, we also have the flyweight title on the line, Alejandro Pantoja versus Steve Ereseg. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we've also got the return of the King of Rio, Jose Aldo, coming back against Jonathan Martinez. What was your initial thoughts on that? Just while I look up uh, Jose Aldo, Harrington. My initial thoughts on that were like, if Jose Aldo's coming back, let it be against Cruz. Let it be against you know somebody who's not. Uh, you know, in 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 the Jonathan Martinez role, uh, you know, in in the UFC. But either way, super happy to see uh, Jose Aldo back, and you know, fighting ranked competition uh, in Rio. It's gonna be dope. I I don't see Jose Aldo added to the Wikipedia page, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I just I'm trying to find when Jose Aldo's last fight was. I want to see how, how long the retirement was. Hold on, I'm scrolling down to his record. Right now, this is fantastic podcasting. Thank you all for being here. Oh, his last fight was Marab Devalishvili, 20 of August, 2022. So not far off two years uh, by the time this fight comes around. And how old is he? He is 37 years old. So not the youngest by far for a bantamweight, uh, but he's still got name value. You know, I wonder, I wonder what the reason was. I'd be very interested. A lot of the time when fighters retire and they come back like that, um, I don't know. Is it financial? Is it because they miss the sport? You know what I mean? I mean, Mike Tyson for crying out loud against Jake Paul. I know why Mike Tyson's doing this. I don't know why Jake Paul's doing it though. That's ridiculous. Mike Tyson is doing it because he misses it. He wants the thrill and this excites him. He'll be able to go out there and, you know, beat an undefeated guy and all the rest of it. You know, there's many, many reasons for Mike Tyson. For Jose Aldo, from what I understand, the legendary career that he had, uh, made a lot of money. I think he's got some burger restaurants as well down in Brazil. 
uh, he probably just feels that he's still got some something left to give, you know, and he wants to take advantage of it before he definitely doesn't. It. It's like Paul Felder when he came on recently, you know, he still feels like he might have one or two left in him. So why not do it? Why not roll the dice? And Jonathan Martinez, Harrington, to your point, I mean, look, listen, him versus Cruz, that would be phenomenal. That would be amazing. I mean, that would be two legends of the sport. Uh, Jonathan Martinez, that's a reputable guy. You can't put Jose Aldo in there, you know, with a scrub. No, but I mean, he's this is a guy on a six-fight win streak who, who's got wins very recently over Saeed Nurmagomedov and Adrian Yanez. Like, this is a dude who's actively pushing for his own run to a title. I do you believe Jose Aldo is coming back to do just that, make one more push to the title, or get those one or two fights you still have out of your system? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I guess we'll wait and see. I left. I mean, I, I think even for somebody like Jose Aldo, they probably want to go out there and see how they do. If he goes out there and he beats a Jonathan Martinez, number one for Martinez, what a great thing to do. I don't is this is 301 going down in Rio? I think it is. It right? is in Rio. Yeah. The, the king of Rio fighting in Rio for Jonathan Martinez. That's a huge uh, possible scalp for him. Jonathan Martinez also trains with Anthony Smith. Of course, Anthony's got Vito Petrino, Alejandro Pantoja versus Steve Erseg, Michelle Pereira versus Mahmoud Mararov. And of course, Paul Craig against Joe Anderson Brito. Uh, no, 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 he's not. No, Kyle Bauhayo. But I can't. Do that in a Scottish accent, mate. Uh, so shaping up to be quite a decent little card there, Harrington. Yeah, I'm super excited. Also, is I can't remember if they went there, if they did end up going there last year. But I mean, uh, you know, in my mind, like this is I haven't I haven't been super excited having like oh I, I I'm gonna hear the fans in Rio going absolutely insane uh, on a pay per view card in quite some time. So, so uh, I'm excited, and I think that might have as much to do with it as anything. Right, yeah, like, you're yeah. the king of Rio. They're coming how back cool, to Rio. How cool is that nickname, the King of Rio? You know, and everyone just calls it him now, the King of Rio. Uh -huh. You're walking around Rio. People, oh, it's the king. It's the king. He's here. Jose Aldo walks in. You know. <laughs> uh, anyway, so well done to all of them. How do you feel about Anthony's matchup, Harrington? So I immediately went and started looking at like a, over the weekend at, at you know Petrino's whole record, and it's like. He did. He got the win over Tyson Pedro, and it was fairly dominant. But I think he only landed four more total significant strikes. Uh, he had three takedowns, decent amount of takedown time. Uh, I think he had one fight where he had like seven or eight, nine takedowns uh, against Turkaj. Um, you know, so he the wrestling is a very heavy part of his game. Um, I don't know how he's going to deal with somebody like Anthony who's going to bring pressure to him because that's one thing Tyson Pedro really wasn't doing a ton of right like his legs were compromised early and it seemed like he was just trying to, to get to a bell i feel like anthony's gonna bring pressure on him you know uh, come hell or high water and i, I want to see how he holds up yeah listen i don't think i'm breaking any uh, secrets here when i say anthony's under a lot of pressure in this matchup you know so obviously he's gonna have to bring his a game as well it's an undefeated guy uh it's a bit of a step down shall we say not in terms of danger of the opponent in terms of fan recognition and ranked opponents and stuff like that uh i don't think tyson pedro was particularly motivated in that fight i think he knew it was going to be his last fight and you know if you, if you know your career is done after this where most people i think or 50 percent of people would want to give their best performance he, he didn't seem overly motivated and i think because he knew he was retired Got to retire. Um, speaking of which, he had the shortest retirement ever. He just came out of retirement. Another one. He, he's got into the boxing world, apparently. He's going to take some professional boxing matches. All the best to Tyson Pedro. Very, very nice guy. Yeah, for Anthony, though, let's be honest. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. It is. So he's got to really, really apply himself. That's why I said to him, I said, listen, if you don't want to do the podcast while you're training, I totally get it. Because, you know, you want to leave no stone unturned. You know, you got to put the fight camp first, you know, you can't, no stone unturned, you know, obviously follow a strict diet, stay off all the alcohol, no late nights, no partying, minimize travel, you know, 100% focus on the fight because, you know, as I said, there's a bit of pressure on him here. There's always pressure in fights, but of course, Anthony, uh, you know, he's, he's coming off the back of that loss to Khalil Roundtree, granted, short notice and whatnot, but yeah, tough fight for him, tough fight. Anyway, um, of course, I fully expect him to get the job done, mind you. Fully expect him. But still, you can never take anybody lightly. Always got to look at your opponent 
as the toughest guy. It's all, every fight, even though, let's say, so he's fought John Jones, right? Every fight is the toughest fight of your career, given the circumstances. When he fought John Jones, of course, that's the toughest opponent of his career. But every time you fight, the goalposts move. You know, if you've been successful and you're working towards a title fight, all right, this one's a number one contender matchup. This is my first main event. This one's for the belt. Whatever it is, the goalpost always moves. And now for Anthony, given you know a different set of circumstances, this again becomes the biggest fight of his career for him mentally and in terms of outcome for his journey. You know, so all the best to Anthony, and he will be back on Monday. Son of a bitch, better I'd be anyway. Leave me talking to you. We're going to have Rebecca Bisping joining us for a little segment or two today as well. Uh, there's some weird stuff going on on social media. We'll talk about that. But we're going to talk about Saturday night, Martian Ty Vora versus Ty to Avasa. Ty to Avasa came out looking really, really deadly, swinging as always. Did a bit of damage to Ty Bora early, opened him up, bit of blood on display. Ty Bora goes forward. Do you know what impressed me about Ty Bora? He fought him. He wasn't trying to use a strategy. And that's kind of what you got to do against Ty to Avasa. Yeah, okay, if you've got the movement and the speed and the long jab and all the rest of it to do that, fantastic. But Ty Bora is not really that guy. But he's a big dude. He's very strong. And it's like, listen, if Ty's coming at you like that, you've got to fight fire with fire. He did that. He went forward. He backed him up. Beautiful combination. Level changes. Get the takedown. And then it was done. But what was your thoughts? I thought, I mean, it, it kills me anytime I see a guy, you know, le letting his opponent get the hands clasped because he wants to reach over and throw shots that, that are like, it wasn't like an elbow to the side of the head. It was a, he reached over his body to, to try to throw some punches on the ear of Tybora, let Tybora get the body lock. And at that point he got him down and it was just all over. And I think like, that's the, the frustrating part with me for Ty, because he is so dangerous when he's on the feet, but the moment he's on the ground, it's just all the power get ups. There's no structure. There's no technique. And it's like, you know, I, I, I want to see somebody who's that powerful and that dangerous at least have the wrestling get ups to get himself back up and give himself that puncher's chance. Yeah, no, no, I kind of agree. Listen, Taz, he's going to work on that. You know, I'm not sure how many losses that is now in a row, but what is it? Two or three, something like that. He's a fun addition. Four. Is it four? Jeez. Jeez. Yeah. I think it's four. I, He's a fun addition. I like to tie to Avasa. I said it on the broadcast Saturday. He just makes me smile, man. He does, right? The way he handles himself from the moment he walks out, the choice of music, the way that he fights, the celebrations, he's brilliant. I, lo I love him. I love the way he fights. I love the energy that he brings. But you got to get the wins. You know what I mean? So he's got a bit of work to do, and I say that with respect, but... It's just the truth, man. You know, can't be making mistakes like that at the highest level. Uh, and then the co-main event, Brian Battle versus Ange Lusa. Brian Battle. Brian, keep an eye on this name, man. Brian Battle's doing big things. Granted, unfortunate circumstance Saturday. An eye poke. Accidental. Thumb in the eye. Fight stops early. Ange Lusa says he can't continue. Oh, shit, hits the fan afterwards. Ange Lusa just says he can't fight and he's blind in one eye or whatever it was that he said. And then he's trying to get a Brian Battle. You know, uh, all shit hit the fan. Brian Battle had quite the promo on the microphone afterwards. Uh, but Brian Battle, I thought he looked brilliant. He looked really, really good. Because Orange Lucer is a tough bastard. We're going to move on. We've got lots of breaking news to get to and lots of stuff to talk about. Uh, Orange Lucer, though, is not an easy man to defeat. And yes, Brian hadn't beaten him. But given what we saw in the six minutes of action, it looked like he... I'd be forgiven for saying it looked like that was trending that way. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those where if that happens five minutes later and it has to go to an early judge's scorecard, you know that's coming out for, for Brian Battle. And that's a guy who, you know, he looks better every single time you see him in the octagon. And you guys were very quick calling on commentary. That's the best Brian Battle we've ever seen. Yeah, yeah, no, he's big. He's got great grappling. He's tall for the division. He's got great striking. Keep an eye on the name Brian Battle. I got a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot more of him. Maybe a lot, maybe a little appearance on the podcast as well. So we'll see. All right. This episode is sponsored by Buy Optimizers that basically specialize in magnesium to make sure that you are sleeping great. Look, listen, we're all trying to take care of our body. Health is wealth. But if you're not getting the right sleep, then you're not going to recover properly from your workouts. You're not going to be effective and productive the next day. And you're just all around going to be a bit of a cranky bastard. Okay. Did you know that there is one phase of sleep that almost everybody fails at? And that phase of sleep is responsible for most of your body's daily rejuvenation. We are talking about deep sleep. 
Okay. And if you don't get enough of that, you're going to struggle the next day. Now, why don't most people get enough of uh, the deep sleep? Well, a big problem is a magnesium deficiency of 80% of the population suffer from a magnesium deficiency. Magnesium increases GABA, which encourages relaxation on a cellular level, which is absolutely critical for sleep. And of course, for deep sleep. Magnesium also plays a key role in regulating your body's stress response system. Those with magnesium deficiency usually have higher anxiety and stress levels, which negatively impact sleep as well. Now, you got to know this as well. Don't go out there and buy any kind of magnesium, okay? It's important to understand that most products out there only have one or two forms of magnesium. The reality is your body needs all seven forms of this essential sleep mineral. That is why I recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. Magnesium Breakthrough contains all seven forms of magnesium designed to help calm your mind, help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and then wake up refreshed. The deep sleep benefits are very, very noticeable. Ever since I've been using Bioptimizer's Mag Breakthrough, I'm telling you, I am sleeping like a baby. So, Give it a try. Go to buyoptimizers.com slash BYM and use the code BYM10 and you're going to get 10% off. And by the way, in addition to that discount, when you use the promo code BYM10, there's always amazing gifts with the purchase. That is why I love Buy Optimizers. You get the seven forms of magnesium. You get a deep sleep. You get a discount and you get a nice little free gift. So as I said right now, go to buyoptimizers.com slash BYM and use the code BYM10 for 10% off your order. Uh, let's have another look here at the fight card before we move on. Anything else we got to get to? Mike Davis. Oh, there's another name that needs a mention. Mike Davis versus Natan Levy. Mike Davis was brilliant. I love watching that guy fight. He is so good with the boxing. Saturday night, the grappling was fantastic as well. He's a very high-level mixed martial artist in every sense of the word. The boxing, I'm telling you, it is so nice and crisp and powerful. That first right hand that he hit Levy with, dropped him, folded him. I thought he was unconscious. Then he gets the job done. I think it was a submission in the end. Yeah, arm triangle round two. You know, I was speaking to Mike Davis last week. I asked him about this on the microphone. He doesn't like fighting. He doesn't enjoy combat. He doesn't enjoy beating somebody up. But he enjoys the freedom of what being a successful UFC fighter gives him. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, and it's like, I don't know, that's a doubly scary guy. You know what I mean? Somebody who's like going to hit you and like you can see there's pain in his side that he has to do this to you. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, you know, you talk about all the time. Why, why do any of these guys do it? Right. You want to provide a decent life for your family and you see it as a way to do it. And if he's just that skilled at martial arts, there's guys who've hated playing football. They hate the game of football and they're, you know, multimillionaires because of it. Like it's you who know, hates. Give, give me a football that hates football. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. I believe it was Jadavian Clowney. He when he was ah, college, Jadavian, good old Jadavian. <laughs> they asked him. They were like, "Oh man, how much do you love football? Going out there to play with your brothers?" He's like, "I don't, I don't like this. I hurt people. I'm not about, I'm not about doing that. I'm not about this practicing nonsense. But I'm going to make my family generationally, generationally wealthy. So I'm going to stick with it for a few years." Did he really mean that, though? Or was he just trying to give a nice little soundbite? Like, Mike Davis, I don't enjoy this. I'm a martial artist. F*** off. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> right, you're a nice guy. When you land that right hand, you look like you enjoyed it there. When you choked him out unconscious, you look like you're having a whale of a time. You know, it's like, guys, guys, I'm a nice guy, okay? I do not enjoy <laughs> this. I don't enjoy it. I don't love throwing a viciously fast, right hand right through somebody's skull i'm just really good at it you know listen i get I what he's like, saying but but that feels good that feels good so i don't like showing up to them. training and and clowning on all my training partners making everyone look a fool around me as i as i beat them up at my will that stinks i hate yeah, it yeah yeah i uh <laughs> call bullshit on the on the footballer as well that's bullshit man okay right to to get at that level of football you got to enjoy it Otherwise, you would have given up a long time ago when you were playing football at school, middle school, high school, college. If you didn't like it, you wouldn't have got good at it in the first place. That's true. Well, I uh, I don't know, man. There Bullshit. are definitely guys. There are definitely go guys on, from a third world country. There's definitely guys from third world countries who are, who are you know, Nikola Jokic, I'll give you a for instance. He's a basketball player. Hates basketball. Bullshit. He's like, I can't wait to go Bullshit. home and play no with way. my horses, dude. No yeah, way. Te you're telling me. Just... No, he, no, no, 
<laughs> just because how tall is he though? He's like seven foot five and like <laughs> 290 pounds. Yeah. And he man. moves like you, a gazelle. It's crazy. When you're seven foot five or whatever the hell he is, I doubt he's seven five. Maybe is he even over seven foot? I don't know. I'll look it but, up. But when you're that high, when you're that height, it's like, listen, dude, you might not like this game, but you're seven foot tall. Okay. You ain't doing much else. Okay. You ain't you are designed, you are built for this, you were given this DNA. Don't be a prick. That's the only one I'll accept. Other than that, you you uh they all bloody like it. Anyway, uh, so well done to everyone that competed Saturday night. Tiago Moises got a quick win as well over Mitch Ramirez. Uh, Jeff Alfilo beat Ode Osborne. All right, there you go. Oh, Vincent Pru as well. Got to give him a shout out. Kind of a slower pace fight, but in round three, him and Enzechiku. Kennedy and Z- Here's the thing, Enzechiku. Enzechiku. And all three of you? consistently said it a different way on the broadcast. No, I know. This is the thing. Right? Because <laughs> I, I will follow the play-by-play guy. right? And on that occasion, it was John Gooden, who's great at what he does. Shout out, John. Nice guy. Brendan Fitzgerald says it ends a chute woo. John Annick says ends a chute woo. Or maybe I've got that the other way around. I have no idea what John Gooden was saying. <laughs> he, he wasn't saying either. So I'm just like, I'm just going to say it the way that John Annick says it. Because John Annick's very, very anal about the pronunciations, as we've said. Uh, but the fight, it, it was kind of a slower-paced fight in round one and two. But then in round three, they just kind of traded in the pocket. I enjoyed that. Really good. OSP, most wins in the light heavyweight division. Second most finishes as well. Yeah, unbelievable. Bit of a dark horse in that division. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think he was the biggest underdog on the card as well. Like, something like that. Like, it was... He was expected to win. He was expected to lose that fight by knockout in the first round. So to see him in the third throwing hammers with with you know one of the more dangerous strikers in the division was super cool to see. Yeah, no, it, it really was. So what in the world of mixed martial arts, there's things going on, but we've got to talk about this. We touched on Ryan Garcia recently. Um, it appears that Ryan Garcia is having a bit of a meltdown. It really does. Uh, in my humble opinion, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychologist, but I think one look at this guy, all the stuff that he's posted on social media, and uh, give me two minutes, babe. Uh, um, you can clearly see there's some things going on, right? So he posted, he's been posting a lot, talking about getting taken to, uh, what was it What was it called, Brian? Bohemian Grove. Bohemian Grove and watching kids be forced down and sexually abused and stuff like that. Um but he managed to film it all on his phone at the same time and stuff. So there's some kind of inconsistency. Yeah, but then he lost his phone, so. No, he lost his phone. Okay, all right, all right. He's out of his mind. And, and I'm not saying this from a comical standpoint. I actually said, you know, it's a shame and it's sad to see and he needs some help. And he needs his bloody phone taken off him. And then there was a video coming out just recently where he says that the Athletic Commission in New York won him uh, assessed, evaluated, in order for him to be licensed there. Brian, roll the tape. Sure. I'm going to sue the NYC commission, and I'm saying this why. They're trying to challenge me for a mental evaluation. I said, okay, what is your premises for the mental evaluation? Well, your tweets and your posts, I said, is it not my U.S. constitutional right to have free speech? So um, because I'm tweeting what I'm tweeting, uh, you, uh, that's premises for a mental evaluation. Premise. No, that's curious. So now you're trying to mess with my constitutional rights. Now I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue you for, for defamation of character. Actually, they don't, they, they won't test Mike Tyson if you fought in New York, but they will test me. Huh, sounds a little fishy to me. And I love Mike. Mike loves me. Cannot wait for them to actually take me to court because I will literally defeat him. My own therapist told me I should be smoking weed. She off, you know, but I mean, she told me, why, why, why aren't you allowed to smoke weed? Thank you. Thank-. She goes, you know, maybe you should try ashwagandha. I never even tried ashwagandha. She said that it will help me. And then she said, why haven't you tried shrooms? I'm like, I don't want, I wouldn't right. try shrooms. I don't you ever get the try idea. shrooms. Like, it goes on and on. He says that he's going to sue the New York State Athletic Commission says that he's going to sue them. Um, here's the thing. As I said, he seems lately like he's going through some stuff. We'll just leave it at that. 
uh, the New York State Athletic Commission or NYC Athletic Commission, uh, NYAC. Who cares? New York NYSAC. State. NYAC. Yeah, yeah, New York State Athletic the, Commission. The, the commission, the New York State Athletic Commission, they, 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 they've ultimately got to protect him and they've got to protect themselves because the, the New York Athletic Commission is incredibly tough and renowned to get licensed by. You know, and I had to jump through all kinds of hoops. Obviously, I had my eye issue, so I know about this firsthand. You know, it was not easy. I had to do a lot of stuff. I had to jump through so many hoops. And maybe one day I'll talk about that a bit more openly. It was not bloody easy, let me tell you that. And it all stems from, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a boxer, I forget when it was, and he sued the Athletic Commission for, yeah, I, th I think he might have died. I think he might have died afterwards and he didn't get the car that he needed or something like that. I'm butchering this story. But anyway, ultimately, they had to fork out something like $10, $15 million because they became kind of found liable, you know. So you learn your lesson, you know what I mean? And you make sure that, A, you're not going to be liable for anything else like that going forward, and B, that you're making sure that people don't get hurt and injured or ultimately pass away, which is you know, should be the primary concern of, of any kind of athletic commission. So they see that and they say, right, we want to get you evaluated. There's nothing wrong with them saying that at all. And if he's got nothing wrong with him, he should welcome that. You know, it's not about your free speech, buddy. It's not about your bloody free speech. It's about knowing whether or not you are mentally fit to step into a boxing ring. Yeah, and it's like, I don't, you know, I don't care what you were saying. It's how you're saying it, right? It's the yes. pacing around your house, selfie videos on Twitter and, and you know, tweeting at odd hours of the night. You're supposed to be in training camp for, as you said, your next fight is your biggest fight. So this is the biggest fight of your life. It's uh, a month and two days away, and you're now concerned about needing to go and, and take an evaluation but by, by an athletic commission for that fight, that should be the only thing on your mind is like jumping through the hoops that you have to for this fight. So this fight can go on. Instead, you're talking about, you know, finding God and converting people and, and what's happened to these children. Yes. Every athletic commission in the country should be looking at you. 100%. And that's their job. As I said, ultimately to make sure that you are fit to compete and you are safe enough to compete. Boxing is a terrible sport. Boxing, people pass away. You know what I'm saying? It's a really sad stat. Things on average 10 people a year all around the world because it's nothing but headshots, okay? Um, so you should be thanking them that they're doing their due diligence and they're being important and they're thinking of your safety and just go down the street, booking with a bloody guy that can assess you like that. And who knows? Maybe they find that there is a few screw loose, screws loose. And maybe you've got to do a little bit of work. I think he's... He's just coming off of a loss, first loss in his career, probably one of the first losses no, he, in his he's life. He's got a win since then, if I'm not mistaken. He got the win in between. But he's fight the next guy he's fighting is just as dangerous as Tank. Probably, yeah. he's a very, I think he's just panicking because there's a good chance that he also loses that fight in, in a much more vicious manner. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I, mean, I understand what you're saying. That always brings pressure, but I think it's just a case of, you know, young, Famous, you know, he's had some fights. He's probably surrounded by some bad people. There's been a lot of accusations that I know nothing about, but people talking about cocaine and stuff like that. He even publicly came out and denied that at a press conference. You know, which is he shouldn't he shouldn't have done that. Maybe he just has people, a cold. Yeah, well, may, maybe he is. Maybe he's partying hard or whatever. But partying hard is one thing. You know, ranting and raving on your phone on a daily basis doing bloody lives with Andrew Tate and talking about the stuff that he was talking about. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people on here, a lot of like far right people are going to say, oh yeah, the, the elites are doing that. And I know you're going to say that as well, Brian, right? Well, they are. You just don't have to be manic in public about it. You know, you well, can, you well, can we, be we, more we, collective. We, 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 listen, <laughs> I don't know that they are, buddy. I don't, you know, all these actors, they're all pedophiles and they're all raping kids. I don't think that's the case. I'm sorry. Look up Isaac. Kaplan, right. I believe his name is. There's some mad shit goes on in the world, and there's some very, very weird, sick people out there, right? I don't think, I don't think Ryan Garcia was exposed to that. I don't. I think he's talking out of his goddamn ass. I think he's yeah. mentally ill and making up absolute shit. I also think that a lot of people, and whilst granted there will be a lot of weight to some things, I also think that a lot of stuff that you see and read on the internet, guys, isn't. 
fucking true. And that's the before you start all those uh, uh, Hollywood Bisping defending his Hollywood buddies. What are you talking about? I don't have any Hollywood buddies. Okay, I'm just saying that this this thing that everyone's a rapist and all pedophile and they're eating babies' heads and stuff like that. As far as I know, it's not true. Okay. And as far as I can, I would put money on it that Ryan Garcia is talking out of his goddamn ass because he's having a mental breakdown. Well, we, I mean, we saw how easy it is to to lead the right astray, right? By just say by dog whistling that there's people are abusing children, right? We 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 saw it with the Q drop. Remember that five years ago, uh, Q said this, Q says that. People legitimately believe this stuff, and it was like a it was a four chan message board messing around. So it's like. Could somebody like Ryan Garcia, who has an outsized personality and probably a, a you know a bipolar episode coming on, could he use that to get people on his side they, for whatever you know thing he's got make, he's making up in his mind? God bless. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, you have such a wild take on everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, what are you, I, do you talking guys, about? Do you not remember when the the Q drops were happening? People were like, "Oh, Trump is giving secret messages through this message board." Yeah, I mean, I saw the people that thought that people Trump has been secret president the whole time, and and those people are absolutely out of their minds. But the the same people that are like a zealot in whatever they're going to take on yeah. in their life, you know, it doesn't matter what well, it is. I'm going to stop you both there. Right, yeah. Harry did this MMA the podcast. Of Pandora's box, and you're talking out your ass. Brian jumps in straight away. He's like, "Here we go, baby. We're off to the races." Allow me to get this back on course, okay? Talking about Ryan Garcia, he's having a mental breakdown. The New York State Athletic Commission are doing right. They are not suppressing free speech. They are expressing concern for his mental welfare, and I, for one, applaud them for that because in a sport where you take hits to the head, sadly, that can happen. So it reminds yeah. me of that Key and Peel sketch with uh, where he's like, is this man actually crazy? You know, he's like, that's not fair for me or him. Oh, uh, it's it's hilarious. I'll show I it to you. I do like Key and Peel. Key and Peel are absolutely hilarious. Uh, okay, so John Jones, Tom Aspinall, right? We want to see them in the octagon one day. And we might have had a little preview about that at the weekend because John Jones was at the Thunder outside john jones uh was at the arnold sports festival in birmingham england i think it was there because i was there a couple of years ago tom aspinall was also there of course as we know john jones recovering gonna fight stipe jones uh, tom's the interim champ a lot of people want to see them throw down tom seized the opportunity uh got his youtube crew around with him had the microphone on goes up Breaks the line, walks to the front, and has a little, not a confrontation, not a confrontation, but there was a little bit of chest puffing and alpha maleness going on. Let's have a look, Brian. Hello, just saying hello. Good, nice to meet you, too. It's that bit there. We're going to do this thing. I would hope so. I would love to, man. I would hope so. Respect, man. All the best. Respect. All the best. We'll do a quick picture. Sure. Yeah? Let's get it. A face-off. No, no, just no. A... No, no, okay. No. Number one, the face-off, Tom. I know for a fact Tom doesn't do face-offs. Tom, I've done appearances <laughs> with Tom, right? And people come up and say face-off, and Tom says, no, I don't do that. But he wants to get one with Jones because he's smart. I get it. You know what I mean? That'd be a viral shot, them two squaring up, you know? And Jones was just like, nah, forget that. Um, but that's Tom's move. He puts his hand on the shoulder. If you look at the fight with Sergey Pavlovich, Madison Square Garden, before they started, he puts the hand on the shoulder. Right, he did it. I think he's done it in numerous of his fights. He's done it many times. Puts the hand on the shoulder, and it's kind of two things. One is being nice and saying, "Hey, there's no animosity here. This is a personal. It's just business." But also, there's an element of big brothering your opponent, saying, "Don't worry, don't worry. This will be fine. This is going to be okay." Tom goes up, hand on the shoulder. Jones is like, "No, you don't. You ain't pulling that shit with me." And I love it. I love it. I can't wait for that fight to go down. Of course, Jones versus Stipe, but. Uh, what are your thoughts, Harrington? I dude, Jones, he talked a lot. He talked a lot over the last couple of months about, you know, I this this Tom Aspinall fight is huge. This is we can make, you know, big box office with this. And when they're face to face, all he has for him is an yeah, I hope so. Not like, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, we're gonna do it on this day. You know, let me get Steep out of the way in November. Let's plan spring of next year. There wasn't any of that. It was just a very non-committal sizing him up which yeah. I, you know, I didn't love. Yeah, that's a fair point. 
that is a that is a fair point because you you would have thought that he would have said, yeah, well, listen, let me take care of Stipe, and then don't worry, I'll take care of you with a smile on his face. I mean, it was very cordial and very mature from the pair of them. Even that that one little moment, I mean, it wasn't even bad. That's as close to a little bit of you know, I'm in charge, no, I'm in charge type thing. Uh, but you're right. Should he have said that? I don't know. I mean, of course, Tom wants that fight. Tom's a nice guy. He's respectable and, you know, he's not going to cause any drama. In fact, he even said afterwards, he said, I, I want to fight the guy in an octagon. I'm not trying to fight him at some signing event. You know, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but, yeah, that was kind of a curious response. You're right. I agree. He should have said, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. You're next. Let me t take care of Stipe and we'll figure it out. So, or maybe it was just like, I'm not letting you be in the driver's seat. You know, if we decide, if it happens, it happens, but I'm the champ. You, you know what so, I mean? So you got then three instances of him playing it cool, right? Like he's like, yeah, we'll see. Maybe I'll fight you. By the way, get your hand off of me. And no, I'm not taking a fan picture with you squaring yeah. up like we're oh. going to make fight. That's big brothering right there. Are you saying that Jones is currently 3-0 and against Tom Aspinall? I'm just saying, I'm just saying that's three strikes, and it seems like Tom He's might have been out that the psychological warfare. No, it's four and oh. Tom's going to him, right? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Jones oh. didn't go to him. He's minding his own business. Tom comes up. He's like, All right, I'll let him jump the line. All right, you're waiting in line to see me, are you? Okay, come on, get a picture. <laughs> no, you can't have a face up. No, get your hand off me. And no, uh, I'm not agreeing to a fight. I'm the boss, I'm in charge. Uh damn. I wish we didn't speak to Tom last week. I wish it was this <laughs> week. I would love to hear his his take on all of that. But uh, fair play. Rebecca, are you there? Come in, come in here. Uh, I saw a story on social media, and I'm gonna I've got a chair for Rebecca here so she can sit down. In your own time, Rebecca, we're live on a show. It's the number one MMA podcast on planet Earth, probably the best podcast that you've ever I've I've heard the thunder. Welcome to the show, Miss Rebecca. Bow, 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 bow. Hi, um, hi, Harrington. Hi, properly. Brian. Hi, Rebecca. Come, oh, my God. No, 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 it's okay. I Get, haven't come. even sat down I yet. Know, I know, but you don't have to, like, lean in and Jesus. stuff. Jesus. Well, I do. Michael, you need to move this. Move what? This arm. Okay. Jeez, Louise. Thank Look you. at this. Married couples. I tell you what, eight sleep ain't going to fix this. Right? The, <laughs> the eight sleep fix. No, I think no, no, you no. can. No, no, you want this one. Eight sleep can uh, fix the temperature of the bloody bed. Can't do anything about the bickering. Oh, uh, he thinks I nag, but whatever. She does nag. All right. Uh, you, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you tee this one up, and then, Brian, just give us a one-shot of me and Rebecca. No offense, Harrington, but, you know, <laughs> oh. the gas digital <laughs> studios. Um, right. Tell us about this woman with the five head. Uh, so she formerly of a five head trying to get it down. Uh, Beth Halsey, a 27 year old, she went under the knife for what they're calling a forehead reduction surgery, um, said it was life changing thanks to all the bullying she was getting uh, beforehand. OK, OK, so this so, is a before shot, I'm presuming. Oh, Brian, give us that still again, because because I tell you what, that that has to have been a before shot. It's, now, it's not that bad. It's a big forehead. Let's be honest. That's a big, that, that is a five head. But with a fringe. A six or a seven bangs. head. Okay. It really is. Um, but number one, how the hell did they go about reducing somebody's forehead? That's a very good question. Brian, if you could look that up and just let me know when you've found anything. Because what are they going to do? Chop into a head, remove a piece of the skull, and then somehow condense the head? I would have suggested what they would do is do um like a hair transplant like further down towards her eyebrows so that reduces the look of the forehead yeah well you know oh shit who, who am i texting there oh it's you um but here's what i wanted to talk about not just the madness of that i mean number one listen this is a prime example of the world gone soft okay look like she, she she's a pretty girl right she's not an ugly girl she's not unattractive Right. right, she could just grow her hair. She could have a fringe. Apparently, she got sick of the fringe. Yes, Brian. So what they it is. Oh, let's get rid of the woman. <laughs> it it is a hair uh a hairline movement right. surgery. Yeah. So they remove excess skin on your forehead and pull your hairline down. Oh, they do remove excess skin. Oh, yeah. Wow. So they kind of um, like tighten up your hair. 
I don't, I might, I disagree. I don't think it's a world gone soft. I think if that's what she wants to do and if she's got the money for it, if it's bothering her and if she's like being bullied because of it, yeah, then, then go ahead. If it's going to give her more confidence and make her feel better about herself. Well, then no, more no, power to her. No, but she's saying because she, the, the, the quote is because she was bullied. So she's gone out there, she spent £9,000 on this surgery. Okay. She's not a bad looking girl. Mm. She had a fringe. She just said she got sick of the fringe. So now she's going to go out there, spend £9,000. You know, to some mm. people, that's a life changing amount of money. It is. You know, it is. I think at a certain point, you're just going to toughen it up and suck it up because look at that. There you go. I mean, all right, oh, fair she enough. Looks, she looks good. She does look better. Looks a little bit like Nina Drama. She's always going on about her forehead being big. How's your forehead? In proportion. It's in proportion. I think. No, but g- girls <laughs> are nasty. Is that her there? Is that after Brian? I mean, uh, to be fair. I'm going to say. Yeah, you can see the surgery scar. Yeah, I'm going to say it was probably guys saying that. I don't think girls. No, um, girls are nastier I know girls, than men. Now with social media, it's both. Because people are faceless. I bet she was being bullied on social media. I bet it wasn't like a school thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, give, give us a full shot, Bri. There we go. Um, yeah, well, girls are mean. They do. Like, like, like mean. guys get a lot of shit, but we bust balls, and, yeah, we can say some things out of turn sometimes. But girls are even meaner. Were you bullied at school? I wasn't bullied. Oh, Thankfully, oh, I wasn't bullied. Wow. Why, why would I be bullied? Why would you be bullied? You I must mean, have had something. What did they call you? What did they tease you for? Nothing. Like, nothing? I, I had no. Nothing at all. I, well, let me speak. All right. I had bad skin, but I wasn't bullied because of it. That was more a me thing. Like, I thought everyone was staring at me and judging me, but they, but they weren't. So you're they talking weren't. about a bit of acne yeah. and spots and stuff. So yeah. that's where the kids get it from. I, I believe you suffered as well. <laughs> I had a few spots as a kid. Yeah. Um, I did have another trait, but I don't know if I want to say. It's what is kind it? Of embarrassing. Go on. No, I don't think I want to say. Well, what, it was now like everyone I, wants I to was know. known as having this. <laughs> but having like, what? But like, your I wasn't eyes? bullied. But I, oh, it's right. wrong with my eyes. No, my eyes are watery. Um, but I don't want to say it's kind of Well, just bloody say it. I had small, pointy boobs. <laughs> <laughs> they were really pointy. <laughs> And like people used to comment, but I wasn't. It wasn't like bullying. No, uh, wasn't. I wasn't bullied because of my pointy breasts, pointy boobs. All right. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, I didn't know you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, Harrington and Brian, jump back on, please. Uh, were you guys Harrington? I imagine. I imagine Harrington that you were the victim of some bullying. Oh, no, I'm, 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 that. I uh, I was a bully actually. So I'm, I'm oh, on, the, on really? the other side of it. Yeah, 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 yeah dude. Mm. Goodness, Harrington, shame on you. It's not good. It's not good. I do not want to pass that on to to what, the what, what, what was your, you know, why were you such a menace? I don't know, man. You know, it's I think it, it ultimately comes to, you know, just to, you know, low self-confidence, low self-respect, whatever. It's like you just find an external target and it's like, yeah, fuck with that guy make me feel a little bit better, you know. Brian McKay, being no. seven foot tall yourself. Um, so I wasn't big until like high school. Like I grew like two feet in two years it was pretty crazy but uh yeah i was never bullied i was just like quiet and kept to myself i had like some friends i don't know i'm uh, there was dickheads around but like if you don't you know i just didn't associate with anybody like that i i think what i was trying to say before is that listen i think growing up you know as a teenager and maybe it is a little different because obviously social media wasn't around when i was a kid but it's kind of you got to have thicker skin. You know what I'm saying? Like you're going to have, you, it, I think if anything, it probably, it's probably beneficial in some ways to get teased a little bit. You know what I mean? Cause you can't go through life being totally unchallenged. I think and, it depends what kind of personality you have. What about you? Were you bullied? Yeah, of course I was bullied. Loads. Why were you bullied? Bullied uh, because the family, I didn't have good clothes. You know what I mean? My shoes were falling apart. Uh, Cause I was a, loud mouth dickhead i was always we were late for school every day for some reason kids used to bully me and tease me about that we never had the money then we got to high school and i was bullied because of my older two brothers because Conrad and steven had beat the shit out of some younger kids so then they saw me as revenge so we're not talking bullied we're talking proper beat up do you know what i mean like getting the shit kicked out of me not going oh he's got a big forehead a five head no (laughs) i'm talking about getting my ass kicked do you know what i mean and did you ever bully anyone um, I was never a bully, but looking back in hindsight, 
um, can maybe I, I teased I, them a bit too hard uh, thinking I was having a laugh. That's what I was going to say. I don't think you would ever intentionally bully someone to make them feel bad about themselves or to make you feel better. I think you get carried away in the moment and you're trying to be funny yeah. and you take it too far. Oh, Brian, and- how much is not in his head there? <laughs> I have moments yeah. of that for sure where and, and I, I, th- and and I, I still think-, think about them to this day, like things that I said in like junior high school to somebody. This one girl, oh, my God, I made her cry on the bus, and I will never forget it. And, it, oh, my God. It <laughs> she like, probably thinks about it every day to this day as well. <laughs> oh, oh, it makes me feel so bad every time I think about it. Yeah, no, I've definitely done things I regret, said things I regret. You know, I, I, I always think back to this one kid, and what was his name? I forget his name now, bless him. And he was, and I was having a laugh with him, and, and, but, like, I'm very physical, and I gave him, like, a slap on the back. You know, we were told, I was yeah, come on. I give him a slap on the back. And then the games teacher ran out, Mr. Jones, and he did not talk about and Mr. Jones come out and he was disgusted by it. He said, you ever put your hand on him again? I was like, I wasn't putting my hand on him. I was why like, did you do that? Come on, Ray. Oh, that's like that. that. that, that hurts. Do you know what I mean? But it, it, but it was harder than that, <laughs> you know. But uh, that, yeah, that, but made, yeah, that you... made me feel awful because I was like, I wasn't, that wasn't my intention. I was yeah. like being like, treating him as one of the guys. Do you He's know what being I'm saying? jovial. Yeah, being mm. overly jovial. There did, it is. Did he have a problem with it or was it just the teacher? I don't think he had a problem with it until the teacher highlighted it and then maybe he twisted it and manipulated it to go, yeah, I'm a victim. I'm a- yeah, there was no victims back then, really. We were talking about 80s and 90s. Yeah, there was no different. victims. But, but that's um, what I'm saying. Like, you know, this girl here getting a bloody forehead chopped off or getting a new hairline, grow a fringe, put up with it. You're a pretty girl. There's a lot of people out there. Like my mum, for example, she Can contracted I- polio as a young child. Yeah. She spent years in a hospital. Then she was in a wheelchair forever. Then she walked uh, with a really, really bad limp forever. Couldn't play sports or anything like that. And I'm sure she was teased and bullied, and she's never mentioned it. But more. if she could do something about it, I'm sure she would have. Oh, she would have done, yeah, exactly. But so, what's the difference? It's a fucking hairline. It's not a big <laughs> it's issue. Causing her to <laughs> stress. If that's her choice, if she wants to spend nine k on changing her forehead, then that's her business. Well, let's take a vote. We all do our own stuff to make ourselves feel better. Yeah. Right? I've, I've got a prosthetic eye. Right. Of which you I'm going had, in for an had... appointment tomorrow for a new one to be made. I'm wearing a hat. No. You're wearing a hat? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, that is a five head for sure. Sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah for sure. Head. I got a big old forehead. I'll tell, I t- I tell you what, though. Let me just, before we move on real quick, the comment Comments. section... I just go straight to the comments. The, 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 I don't even read the articles uh, anymore. <laughs> uh, rumor has it they call her three head now. Uh, she, I heard she has dreams in IMAX. <laughs> uh, let's have a look. Uh, she went from mega mind to never mind. Yeah, oh, man. there was a couple of good ones before <laughs> mega mind. A sniper's dream. Uh, a fringe would have been cheaper. Correct. Uh, mm. Poor woman. I can't understand how everyone here can be so mean. I hope the woman is sleeping soundly on her ma- on her gigantic pillow tonight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, the comments never never uh, they never failed. Are you leaving in a minute? Yeah, you got to go. I got to go. Well, sad to say that because so that was my input on bullying. Right? Okay. Well, she and, never, and, and she was never bullied say, uh, other than having perky tits. They were very perky. Oh, and- ben, stop <laughs> it! And I literally never bullied anyone. I just want to say that. I don't know. I bet you could be quite bitchy. Yeah, behind their backs, <laughs> not, to, <laughs> not to their face. Exactly. That's different. That's different. I would never. You're muted, Harrington. I was going to say, did you ever do the classic girl bullying, uh, which is like you call your friend and then you call the third girl on a three way and get her to talk shit about the first girl who's on the other end of the line? That's, that's classic vind- girl bullying. That's some vindictive no, stuff. What movies like have games. you watched? Yeah. Oh, what movies? You're right, right? Nobody <laughs> no, no, does that in real life. That's kind of like, like mind games. No, it wasn't as deep. We just were a bit bitchy behind each other's backs. And that but was to that the face, there. perfect. Oh, it, of course. Yeah, it's like, like me in a restaurant. It's like me in a restaurant because we're English. Like, what, what, where were we recently? I was eating. You were like, Sorry. This is hard. bad. This is bad. So bad. And it was bad. It was like so tough and chewy. It was like an old shoe. And then they came over. I was, I said, oh, delicious. So great. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, (laughs) 
Right, go on. Anyway, yeah. Go on, get okay. Lucas. Bye, guys. We might bring you back for another segment if I get bored of Harrington. All right, today's episode is sponsored by Eight Sleep, which is going to revolutionize the way you sleep. It's going to make you sleep deeper. You're going to sleep better, and you're not going to have an argument with your wife, and you're going to feel even more refreshed. Look, listen, when you go to sleep, some people are too hot. Some people are too cold, and that is where Eight Sleep's odd cover comes in. It just goes on top of the mattress like a mattress cover, and then – Given its groundbreaking technology, one side of the bed could be one temperature and the other side, another temperature, whatever you want to set it to, okay? It goes as low as 55 degrees and as high as 110 degrees. Now, sleep science shows that in order to sleep your best, the body temperature needs to drop in the early and the middle part of sleep, and then it needs to rise in the morning. So the pod cover, it will improve your sleep by automatically adjusting the bed's temperature based on your individual needs. The cover can then be added like a fitted sheet and allows you and your partner, as I say, to warm or cool your side of bed as low as 55 degrees and as high as 110 degrees. This thing is fantastic. Mrs. Bisping absolutely loves it. She swears by it. I love it as well. She's always freezing. I'm always boiling. We're getting on like a house on fire and we are sleeping like babies. By the way, check this out, the science. In addition to keeping you at the perfect temperature all night, The pod also tracks your sleep and your health metrics. On average, pod users see their sleep quality improve by 32% just after a month of using the pod. So check it out. You will not be disappointed. Go to 8sleep.com slash Bisping and you will get $200 off and free shipping. You're going to love this product brought to you by 8sleep. The pod cover, this thing's legit. I absolutely love it and I'm proud to endorse it. 8sleep.com slash Bisping for $200 off and free shipping. All right, so anyway, let's get back to mixed martial arts. We were talking about Tom Aspinall and John Jones and Brett Okamoto, who I really respect as an MMA journalist, works for ESPN, great guy. He came out and he's done an updated list. I believe I'm I'm corrected. This is ranked the heavyweight, basically. And he even went as so far, in his words, not mine, to call Jones a paper champion harrington have you got the details there uh yeah i can pull up uh the exact quote here uh he said uh, john jones uh he's he did it in tiers so he said the top tier is tom aspinall by himself he said the second uh he said the goat but the number two heavyweight in the world i said i'll use some verbiage here that some might not like but let's keep it real jones is a paper champion of the ufc's heavyweight division he didn't beat the previous champion France and Ghana to win the belt. He won a vacant title over Cyril Ghan, whose most championship caliber win is arguably over Junior Dos Santos in the final fight of Dos Santos' UFC career. All right, so that sounds kind of harsh, but I guess he is just outlining some facts, right? Th- those are facts. He didn't beat Nganu. He did beat Cyril Ghan. Cyril Ghan is a formidable fighter, you know? Some might say a little one-dimensional. I'm not saying that, but he's definitely a really high-level striker and probably a bit mediocre with the other stuff, you know. Um, Paper champion seems a bit of a harsh assessment. I understand what he's saying, though, because Tom Aspinall is out there fighting heavyweights his entire career in the UFC. He's just blown through everybody, barring that uh, Curtis, uh, what's his name, Curtis Blades, um, unfortunate scenario where he blew his knee out, you know. Uh, I get. I, I, again, this just furthers the commentary and the discussion that these two have to fight at some point, which, again, is what, why I find it kind of surprising that Jones just said, yeah, maybe we'll do it one day. Maybe we won't. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's tough. You know, whenever the, the word paper champ gets thrown around, it's, you know, it is harsh criticism, but you have to look at the divisions where something like this has happened in the past, right? Like, you know, Johnny Hendricks didn't save the welterweight title. Robbie Lawler did, right? He, he won the belt. Then he had the war against the Rory McDonald. Then, you know, like he, uh, the Carlos Condit fight, all of that, like legitimized that belt once again after George St. Pierre left. John Jones came in, beat the the last guy that Francis Ngannou beat, and then hasn't defended the belt again. I. I don't know, you know, how, how you can call that. And I think the the bigger like thing that sticks out in my mind, who would you as a heavyweight, right? Your first heavyweight fight, who would you be more nervous fighting? Cyril Gaon or Sergey Pavlovich, who Tom Aspinall won the belt off of? Yeah, but again, and I'm not here to defend Jones, right? I'm not, but let's look at the details. He beats the he beats Cyril Gaon to become the champ, okay? Because the 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 championship was vacant. Then he was going to fight Stipe Miocic, right? Who was known as the greatest of all time, right? Because he's got the most defenses. And then he gets injured. 
Mixed martial arts is a bit of a sport to prepare for. The fight's the easy part. The preparation and the camps are the hard part. I'm not defending John. You know, we all know. Everyone says I've got a hard on for Tom Aspinall. He's a great guy. He's an incredible fighter. But you got to, but you got to call the facts for what they are. Injuries are a part of the sport, and he got injured, and he's got to come back. You know what I mean? So, I tell you what, Fred Okamoto, he better be ready. You know, when he wants that interview with John Jones, Brett. Brett's gonna go. Uh, Brett's gonna be in for it. He's gonna have a very, very feisty John Jones to deal with there. Uh, but right now, what do you say, paper champion or not paper champion? Uh, look, Tom Aspinall is the one who's calling for top ranked heavyweights who are active and fighting to defend his belt. You know, if you ask me, the 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 real UFC heavyweight championship lives in England. Oh, it is insane to call John Jones a paper champion considering the lineage of John Jones at this point. He's been a champion since he's been like 22 years old. Uh, you just can't say he's not legitimately the champ. Like, no. He's the greatest in the world. He could wear any belt and be the champion. And mm. legitimately. Yeah, okay, yeah. Then, no, no, then, it's, an, it's an interesting take. Harrington, you were going to jump in? Then why don't we have a date for Tom Aspinall? Why don't we have a confirmed, yeah, because I'm sticking we haven't around. Even, we haven't even bloody got a date for Stipe yet. He's still recovering. I'm not defending Jones, and I'm not being a company man. I'm just calling out the facts. He got injured training for a fight, and now he's coming back. You know what I mean? He's not even in camp yet, let alone have a date. He's still not 100% healed. When he gets through Stipe, because they always say, you know, you can't look past this opponent. You don't have multiple fights lined up. When has that ever happened in the history of the UFC or in the history of high-level combat sports? That doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So I understand your point and the reason for asking the question, but the answer to it is very simple. Yeah, but there's no, like, you know, like uh, Conor McGregor already came out and said he wants to fight in June and then again in September. Like, guys talk about that all the time. Oh, I'm not oh, hearing that oh. from Jones. I'm not hearing, yeah. yeah, I want to fight Stipe in the fall and then I'll fight you at International Fight I Week feel like next year. Jones is a little bit more tactical and based in reality when he's talking about the future, whereas people like Connor are shooting for the best case scenario of their career, right? Like, he didn't know he was going to go be the double champ, but he called for it and he got it. And, and that shit happens. But it could have yeah. just as easily not happened. I mean, I mean, Connor's, I mean, all right, let, that's a nice segue to Connor now and we'll get off Jones because we've kind of said our pieces on that. He came out and said he wants to fight because he's doing a lot of press right now for the Roadhouse movie, which I think gets released in a few days. By all accounts, it's pretty good from what I've seen. A friend of mine, Daz Morris, went to watch it. He got invited down to the premiere, said it's decent. He said McGregor's pretty good in it. Uh, so congrats to him and everybody involved. Um, but because of that, he's doing a lot of media. And he was asked, he said, hopefully, he's still hoping for Mike Chandler in June. Yeah, That's he what he said. It. I yeah, was hoping for a December fight. date, then a January date, then it keeps getting pushed back. Then I lose interest and I stop training for a while. Not stop training. I'm always training. But stop full training and start drinking a little bit. So I'm going to go back, regroup, get full tested, and get ready to rock. The date's going to come, and then I'll be ready to rock. Look, listen, I hope so. I hope so. But until we see him with a date lined up, I'd take it over the pinch of salt, to be honest. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he's, he's cracked the code. He's made the money. We've been over this a million times, you know? Is he ever going to fight again is a better question. Is he ever going to fight again? You know, I hope so. I do. I, I think MMA is a better place with him involved. But he doesn't need to. And, he, and for everything that he says, you know, if we're not seeing a fight or a date materialize. Yeah, so it's like, you know, I... I... I don't know. It's 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 almost like, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship, right? The UFC can keep saying, hey, you know, Conor McGregor is going to come back this year and Conor McGregor can keep saying, hey, I'm going to come back next year. And then he gets all the headlines as the quote unquote biggest star in the UFC, even though he hasn't been in the octagon since 2021. Pretty well, sad. he is the biggest star. Pretty good deal. In, he is the biggest star in the UFC. But, you know, Conor, he likes to stay in the conversations every time there's a fight night or a pay-per-view. He's tweeting away, he inserts himself into the conversations, does a great job of keeping himself relevant, not that he even has to do that. His star is so big, he doesn't need to put out tweets and stuff like that to remain relevant. He's Conor McGregor. That's all he, he needs to do. Uh, I want to see him back in there. He's saying Nate Diaz, he's saying a trilogy or a quadrilogy with Dustin Poirier and a fight with Chandler. That's three big fights there. Three big fights. I mean, if I'm Conor McGregor, you want those fights. You want to find Nate Diaz and close the book. 
you want to fight Michael, uh, sorry, um, Dustin Poirier because the last two times didn't go well. One time you got knocked out, the second time you were trending towards the knockout and then you broke your leg, getting knocked out, I mean. And then, of course, Michael Chandler, they've got to close that chapter. So three big fights, and that might be it. He's, what, 36 now? 36, something like that? 36, 37 even? You know, so he's getting up there. Anyway, fair play to him and well done on the movie. Have you seen it, Harrington? No, it doesn't. It, it comes out, I think, uh, next week. I know that because he went on Sydney Sweeney's Instagram uh, when oh. she she posted <laughs> her movie comes out on the 22nd and he responded, mine comes out the 21st. Sydney Sweeney. I was not aware of this name until very recently. Now I'm seeing her name everywhere. I'm seeing her boobs everywhere as well. She's a very attractive lady. Uh, fair play to her. Wish her all the success in the world. Right. So do we talk about Mike Tyson and his training footage against Drake Paul? Or do we talk about Paddy Pimblett saying that he's going to call out Hinato Moicano? What do you uh, think? I, mean, I think Iron Mike. Anytime Iron Mike is the possible topic of conversation, I want to talk about Iron Mike. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? We've been talking about Jake Paul a lot recently, so I don't want to sit here and talk crap. Uh, we made our feelings clear on that. I think it's insane. In fact, even Dana White this morning, he posted a picture on his Instagram story. You know, Jake Paul's next opponent, and it was Clint Eastwood after uh, Mike Tyson, which I get, you know, Clint Eastwood's 75 or 78 or 80 even. God knows how old he is. Um, but Mike Tyson's been training. And he does look good, right? And I do believe, listen, even though he's old, and even though a doctor just came out, I did a video on this on my YouTube channel, a doctor just came out and said, Mike Tyson's at uh, da damage, a uh, danger, pardon me, of a subdural hematoma, where the blood vessels in the brain will rip, something like that. I'm not a doctor. Of course, any time a boxer steps foot in the ring, it's always dangerous. For a fighter, it's always dangerous. UFC, MMA, boxing, whatever. Uh, but at 58, those chances are increased. Also says with an alcohol problem, that can make that uh, the danger heightened. Uh, but again, there's always danger there, and a lot of fighters like to drink as well. It's the 58 years old stuff. But that said, take a look at this footage here. <laughs> Four, he's looking no, good. He okay. All, right. But you don't know. All right. Listen, I'll tell you this. Jake Paul's never fought anybody like that. He hasn't fought anybody with that kind of punch power. He hasn't fought anybody with that kind of aggression or that movement. The signature Mike Tyson movement, the slipping, the head movement, the footwork, the getting on the inside and all the rest of it. Power is the last thing to go. So I do still believe that uh, even though he's 58, I still believe he's got a potential to maybe knock Jake Paul out. He does. He does. I think he got three rounds in him. I think that's I think more than enough. I because I tell you what, I could get in shape now at 45 to do 10 rounds of boxing, 12 rounds of boxing, or five rounds of MMA. I could, right? How successful I would be at the highest level, I don't know. But I know I could get in shape to do it. Be a pain in the ass, but I could do it, right? Can you do that at 58? I just don't know. I really don't know, but he's a special kind of human being. But the thing is, that doesn't give Jake Paul props for doing that. He's still 58. He's still not the Mike Tyson that he was, which is what he's trying to sell to the younger people. I'm stepping in there with Mike Tyson, you know? Except for the considerable amount of money to gain, this is a lose-lose situation for Jake Paul. Without question. I mean, what is he going to do? What is he actually going to go out there and try and knock him out cold? Well, you're going to so knock out. Said. You're going to try and knock out Mike Tyson, a man <laughs> that's almost sixty. That's I mean, just a on, dick dude. move. That's <laughs> right? a dick move, right? Or are you going to get knocked out by a man that's almost sixty? <laughs> I don't that's know, man. Not a good look. You look at those. Uh, old videos of Customato, like at the end of his life, and that dude could definitely throw hands. So, I mean, I I don't know how old he was, but I'm sure he was pushing sixty, oh, <laughs> probably yeah, sure, much older sure. than that. Speaking well, of Customato, Mike Davis, who we were talking about recently, Mike Davis started training with Customato when he was 14 years old. No and way! You can see, you can see that, you can see that in his uh, in his style 
and his ability. So anyway, whatever. We don't want to bang on about Jake Paul. I do like to talk about Mike Tyson, though. Uh, but still, it remains to be seen what happens in that. All right, give me the lowdown on Paddy Pimbler. Uh, so Paddy Pimbler came out. Uh, he said that uh, he needs a couple more months. Uh, they were talking about him possibly fighting on the uh, on the, the on 300 or on the, the Rio card. He said, you know, my kid's going to be way too young then. Uh, I think he's expecting twins, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they're due out uh, right around that time. So uh, he said, I saw something the other day on Twitter that I'm meant to be fighting Moicano at uh, 301. Uh, no, no. My kids will be about two weeks old. I'm not fighting him that soon. I'm not going to be fighting until June or July. But that is who I want next, Hanato Moicano. Money Moicano, you owe me money, lad. I'm coming for you, you little sausage. But hold on, Moicano's got an opponent, right? Moicano's got Jalen Turner at UFC 300, so I don't know what Patty's talking about. Are you sure it's Jalen Turner? If I'm, Am I? I'm no, 99% no, no, no. sure. I could have swore it was somebody else. But look it up, look it up. If it is Jalen Turner, it right now. respect to Hanato Moicano. Because that's yeah, a Hinato tough Mo fight, man. That was the last fight. It was announced during the UFC 299 broadcast. Oh, was it really? Okay, okay. Maybe I was too busy just focusing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Understandable. Job. Um, well, Paddy Pimblett, I mean, of course, he had that close one with Jared. Then he... Had a convincing victory over Tony Ferguson, but of course, it was the shell of Tony Ferguson. And I don't say that to be mean to Paddy, and I don't mean it to be disrespectful to Tony Ferguson. By the way, Tony Ferguson on Rampage's podcast just recently said he ain't retiring. Said he has oh, yeah. got no intention of retiring, and he still feels like he's got a championship running him. That's what he was saying, which is, which I, again, fighters. You need protecting from yourself because he still feels like that. And fair play. He went the distance with Paddy Pimblett, who's a good fighter. You know what I mean? Probably feels he could have made some adjustments. I think he said that he was injured as well. But apparently Paddy's saying he's injured now as well. He's potentially got some torn labrums or something in his shoulders. Oh, yeah. um, I'd like to see Paddy fight a little more regularly. You know, I think he's got he's to fight a little more frequently, I think. If he was injured, fair enough. Uh, if that's true, it's true. You know what I mean? Seems to be quite injury prone if that is the case. However, again, injuries happen. But Moicano is a logical step up. That's where I was going with this. Moicano is a ranked opponent. Moicano's on a roll. He just beat Drew Dober. He's had some good wins. He's got a good personality. And they've been talking shit as well. However, Moicano loses to Jalen Turner. I think the relevance of that matchup would kind of not exist anymore. If he loses to Jalen, I mean, he'd still at that point would be, you know, he's 13 ranked right now. So you got to figure, I mean, Drew Dober's at 15. He probably has cushion to fall back as far as 15. If Moicano is your entrance into the rankings, you know, that still is, is maybe worth it for Patty Pimblick. Cause I don't know. I don't, I don't see anybody else who who's hanging out around the end of that that top fifteen who who looks like it'd be a, n a nice day at the office for Patty Pimblett. No, I agree with what you're saying, but generally, I think if you look at the pattern, they put winners against winners and losers against losers. That's not a hard and fast rule. It's not. It's not. You know, it's not. It's not the blueprint. But generally, that's what they like to do. You know what I mean? So, but we'll see. We'll see. What do you think? If if they were to throw down, who would you favor? I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's hard for me to find anybody in the top 15 who who I'm going to, you know, say Patty Pimblett can beat, you know, just from from what I've seen up to this point. But I mean, who knows, dude? He has proven, uh, you know, I've I've been on the wrong side of some Patty Pimblett tickets more times than I can count. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. My money, my car. Love that guy. Uh, all right. What else do we have here before we get to some questions? In fact, let's do a non MMA story. Uh, okay. There's three good ones here. There's three good ones. Do let, let, Let's start with number two, because I saw this being discussed on the news this morning, and I had some thoughts. I wish I was on the panel on the news, but I wasn't. But I thought, I've got a podcast. We can talk about it there. Oh, I can also, as a producer, I can just call the news station and be like, hey, I got a great guy in your, in your backyard who's, you know, wants to come by the station. Be <laughs> sick. Um, all right. So teenagers, uh, they're essentially using uh, Meta's platforms to be able to score illicit substances, right? So people can go on Instagram and type in, you know, the, the hashtag 
MDMA uh, dealer or MDMA near me or for sale or whatever the case may be. And uh, they'll be, you know, funneled into these users who are doing just that. They're, they're selling illicit drugs, any number of different uh, things you can put in the search bar and it'll pop up. And that's across both Instagram and Facebook. Now, people are saying that uh, the platform knows about this, but they don't want to do anything about it because it's uh, creating interaction, it's creating this, engagement. So they don't want to. This is the uh, CIA's direct sales program. What do you mean the direct sales program? Oh my God, here we go. We're trying to have an intelligent conversation. I am. <laughs> I mean, the biggest drug dealers in the country are literally the CIA. So, uh, yeah. and Facebook and Meta are like in bed with them. This is just the next step. Okay, well, we'll just, without taking that into consideration, because I don't think the children that are putting hashtag MDMA are in bed with the CIA. Okay, I don't think they're covert agents. Weirder shit has happened. But okay, I know. But I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that I don't think old Johnny two seven nine <laughs> selling meth, speed, and MDMA to whoever can get it from Snapchat or elsewhere is in bed with the CIA. Uh, so on the news, they were saying, "Listen, the police need to get involved," right? and and I think they do. The police could monitor the situation, but also I do find it kind of weird how. Social media companies do allow this to happen, and I've seen some terrible stories about children. Uh, they they're getting um, they're having fentanyl overdoses and stuff because street drugs, even if they're just looking for opioids or whatever the case may be, they're they're laced with all kinds of nasty, horrible shit. And fentanyl is a big problem right now. Um, but I just thought if if during COVID times, if you went and if you said anything against the general approach that was censored if you show that your name if you show any naked shots that gets censored darren till is always having his instagram taken down people struggle with that all the time so they have the ability to stop that you know what i mean they have the ability to stop any kind of controversy you know any kind of quote-unquote hate speech but they can't use the same kind of barriers to stop children selling drugs whilst they're advertising, I just that that's the part that I don't understand. This kind of feels like what happened when uh, Xi Jinping came to San Francisco and they shipped out all the homeless people and cleaned up the streets for a week. It's like, oh, we, we could actually do this, no problem. Like this, this could actually get done, but <laughs> it's just they just choose not to do it. Not directly relevant again, but I understand the point what you're making. I do, I do. Let's try and keep it on board. <laughs> keep it on track. I mean, but it's it's like you're talking, you know, government bodies or governing bodies, not government, but like governing bodies. Yeah. They could easily do these things. It's just it's not good for uh, it's not good for investors. So, like, if you're not if you have a board to answer to, you're never looking at like the the humanity of what your business is. You're looking at just numbers. Yeah, but generally, revenue. generally, listen, you know, places and platforms like that, which are massive and multi, multi billion dollar companies, um, they don't want to be associated with people selling drugs, illegal street drugs on their platform and turning a blind eye. And I'm not trying to bloody get us thrown off Google or Facebook or whatever the hell it is, yeah. but I feel like more can be done to protect young children. It's young kids for the most part, that are buying these drugs and having fentanyl overdoses and stuff, and it's just absolutely heartbreaking. If they can put in protocols to have Darren Till flagged for whatever it is that he's saying, right? If they can have... What, what, what's some other ones? Like people are always getting banned temporarily, you know what I mean, and, and kicked off, not Twitter. You can do whatever you want on Twitter these days. But, you know, on Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that, people are getting banned for saying controversial stuff. If they can have the protocols in place to catch that shit, because I guarantee nobody, there isn't a person monitoring Darren Till's Instagram. Do you know what I mean? Sure, but I'm sure Darren Till also has trolls who don't like him, who will just hit report on every questionable thing that he puts up, and then it's now it's in front of Meta's eyes. Whereas, like, I don't think anybody's reporting their drug dealer. <laughs> it's like know? soft swatting, you know? Yeah, kind of. Just people so, with you because you're a public figure. Because he's getting grassed on, basically. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. I mean, grassed people, people fuck with you just because you're a public figure. You know what I'm saying? Oh. Yeah, no, they do. They do. But I've never been, I've never been banned off Instagram. I've never yeah, even had a strike or a warning. Do you know what I mean? Yeah.
it's because your Instagram is is above board. You're you're you know you're you're a little more clean cut and polished than than you know Darren Till. <laughs> Darren Till just is, takes some wild swings every now and then. Uh, let, who else is there? Who's who's who else is like a common one for getting banned on Instagram? I, I don't know. I'm friends with comedians, so pretty much all my friends. Like you can't yeah, tell yeah. jokes on Instagram. That's for sure it's, illegal. Uh, like for example, Lewis. Lewis is always getting kicked off YouTube, isn't he? Uh, yeah, there's a bit of that. <laughs> yeah, they they've definitely lost a few channels over there at Skanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're always having to. I keep seeing it. We're back on the YouTube or whatever. And I have yeah, a little good. chuckle. Uh, anyway, uh, don't buy drugs off Instagram, guys. Don't buy drugs. How about that? Do you know what I'm saying? Just, that's the I official know. BYM stance on, on it. Right. Well, listen, as you're growing up as a young man or a woman, you're going to be curious. And it's just a, it, it's kind of a, a rite of passage. You know what I'm saying? Kids experiment with drugs and they go out and they have a good time. They get surrounded by friends and all the rest of it and they're all doing it. So they get involved and some really have a pawn shop for it and they enjoy it and they, bec- they make it a part of their lifestyle. And some people just experiment and think that's not good for me. But in this day and age, man, in this day and age, you're rolling the dice in a major way. So they do sell mobile testing kits. And that was the only thing I was going to say versus like rather than the abstinence only approach, right, which led to teen pregnancy throughout the 90s. I think it's time to pivot that way with drugs where it's like, guys, look, if you're going to do it, be safe, carry a testing strip with you at all times because those things are super cheap. I was going to say, dude, you can't get kids to wear condoms. You for sure can't get me to do a chemistry experiment before I go get high. The kids are not going down to CVS or the local chemist and buying a testing kit and then they're going to go see johnny on the corner then they're going to buy whatever then they're going to test they're not going to see no. johnny on the corner they're going to see johnny on instagram who lives yeah. six doors <laughs> down from them and they're going to meet him on the corner they're going to meet him on the corner Right, today's episode is sponsored by Shopify, which really is the way to go and what you need to use. If you're looking to take your business online, if you have an idea, if you're already an entrepreneur and you're not online, you're not selling your goods online, and if you're not doing that, then I don't know what to tell you. It's 2024. But of course, getting online, taking payments, having a website, all of that stuff together can be very expensive to do all that. Okay. You've got to hire a team. You've got to build a website and all the rest of it. Well, Shopify, they do it all. They make it very, very simple, uh, very, very cost effective. And before you know it, you're going to be online. You're going to be selling to the entire world and you're going to be accepting every single major payment method. And it's never been cheaper because right now Shopify, which by the way, has a 24 seven customer service available to you, lets you sell across all the social media marketplaces, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, so on and so forth. And right now you can give it a try for $1 per month, which is, as I said, it's never been cheaper. $1 a month. Everybody can afford that. Give it a try when you go to Shopify dot com slash believe as i say if you're looking to take your business to the next level or you've just got an idea for a business give it a try go to shopify okay they are taking over when it comes to the e-commerce platform so as i say the website is shopify.com slash believe you can sign up for one dollar per month shopify.com all lowercase and there it is shopify.com anyway uh Tell me about these uh, the police in Toronto because this is <laughs> quite frankly one of the stupidest things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, yeah, so the cops in Toronto they've seen a rash of home break-ins, right? So their idea to combat that uh, is they said just leave your key fob to your car outside because then they won't have to break in your house and rob you. They only want your car. Just give them your car. <laughs> This is unbelievable. This is just the like how the, said this. the Canadian healthcare system is also telling people to kill themselves if they're sad. So, that like, is true. Canada's hold a, on, hold on, whoa, 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 what? You can't just say yeah. that just like a throwaway. That's a, oh no, it's been in the news for quite a while. the The Canadian Health Service it has like a like a in a kill yourself program, and they've been recommending it for for uh, sadness for depression. For poverty, we'll go, go for it. So there's a Paralympian, right? There's a Paralympian uh, Canadian who was metal. I think she won like a bronze or something. Uh, they, as part of like the government health services, they need to build a ramp for her like new house so she can get in and out uh, on her wheelchair. They said it's going to take so long for us to come out there and complete the ramp. And they gave her a list of other possible solutions. And on that list was euthanasia. 
No. Yes. Yes, dude. Yes. Wow. Wow. You're like Canada's backwards right now, and that's no, that's for real. There's, there's, yeah, no, it is for sure. And oh, listen, sorry, it's gonna take a while. Uh, our backlog of joiners and builders, they got a lot of work on right now. So you might want to consider killing yourself. Jesus Christ. Yeah. And by the way, get if you're sick of getting broken into, just leave your car on the driveway. Just <laughs> right. It's the same kind of thought process it's insane yeah no that's just insane and everything seems to go political so i don't want to get into all that but that is just insane I, it goes back to before about the bloody woman with the five head you know getting the surgery deal with the bloody the little bit of insults it's a rite of passage growing up just like buying dodgy drugs right but don't do not leave your car keys outside on the porch so people can steal do you know what I, I, and what kind of government is advising to do that because they're too lazy to police the neighborhoods properly lazy broke uh yeah understaffed it's all that God. jesus i can't it's insane uh i'm not an expert on that stuff though and i'm not an expert on this one we'll go for the trifecta on that non mma now this kind of plays into what i was saying before that the all the actors and the <laughs> the hollywood elites aren't pedophiles <laughs> but how did you put this in the notes i was a big fan of liz hurley back in the day i'm still a big fan of her you should uh you should pull up this article brian she is still looking pretty darn good so elizabeth hurley uh she's starring in a new movie and it's made like a ton of waves over the weekend it, it went super viral <laughs> Uh, because it is written and directed by her 21-year-old son, and he was behind the director's chair while they were filming a softcore erotic scene uh, with another actress doing like some, you know, heavy lesbian petting. That's I'll pay wrong. to go see this flick. I will see this film. She's a beautiful woman. I will say, Rebecca's gone to pick up Luca, so I can get away with that. Uh, no, Liz Hurley, come on, because she, she's a very, very beautiful lady. Um, all right, Favorite all right, Liz Hurley? okay. Say again. Favorite Liz Hurley. What do you mean, favorite Liz Hurley? Like favorite movie, favorite era, favorite. What do you think I could just rhyme off a bunch of Liz Hurley Dude, films? Pictures yeah. I've seen, Harrington. What do you mean? Yeah, I I'm know. Sorry. Bedazzled. Bedazzled. You get all of it. She's she's a school teacher. She's the devil. It's all the sexy Liz Hurley. All right, whatever. I'm. I'll do you up. think I've seen a movie called Bedazzled? It's got Brendan Fraser. It's incredible. You, you'd like I have not Joe seen Lucas. it. I, and in fact, I'm trying to think of a single Liz Hurley film that I've seen. I can't think Austin of Austin Powers. One. There you go. Austin Powers. Right, yeah. <laughs> I've seen that. She looked fit in it. That's about it. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Austin Powers is uh, hilarious, by the way. No, listen. Listen. It's a bit weird. It is a bit weird that the 21-year-old son is directing her in a porn scene. It was not a porn scene, like a, a sex scene. You know, it sounds bad on paper, and it might be a little bit weird. I mean, I guess the thing is, he's an aspiring writer, director, whatever. They come up with a script. His mom's Liz Hurley. If Liz Hurley's in it, that would probably allow some company to finance the film so it can get made. I guess they didn't have to. They could have rewrote it so the mom wasn't doing the sex scene, but maybe that was it. <laughs> maybe that's what greenlit the movie. Maybe that's why they got the finances. Like, listen, if you're the director, you got to direct me. But that would be a bit of a weird situation. It was bad enough. Rebecca just saying that she's got she got bullied for having perky tits. Imagine if I said, Lucas, got a job for you. You got to direct a mom <laughs> in a sex scene. My God. Oh well. Oh well. I can't wait to see it. Look, sounds like a brilliant film. Uh, yep. Right. Before we lose everybody. And everyone's like, Jesus, can Anthony just get back? Uh, do we have any other MMA stories before we get to questions? Uh, so I thought this was kind of interesting. Uh, Islam Makachev, uh, he says that he was, in fact, offered the 170-pound title shot for UFC 300. He said he came back to Ali Abdelaziz and asked if they could move the event by two weeks so that he'd be able to fight on it. Uh, Ali came back and said, absolutely not, not that, that that's not going to be possible. Islam said that he is still very interested uh, in going up to fight for the 170 pound title. And he hopes he didn't miss it just because this fight is happening. I think two weeks after Ramadan ends. Yeah, no, I saw he said that. And he also said that he wants to fight Dustin Poirier. Yeah, he did. Just engage. He wasn't happy with me. Happy with me. Did you see him tweet at me? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember exactly what he, he said, but I did see this. Talking bollocks, <laughs> you know, fair play. <laughs> uh, listen, just, uh, Justin's ahead of Dustin. Of course he is. I was just saying, Justin Gage is fighting Max Holloway, right? Leon wants to fight. 
you've got a fight against Max, more than likely he wins that fight, I would say, right? But he might get banged up. He might break a hand. He might break a finger. He might roll his ankle. He might get beat up. He might get a broken nose. You just never know what happens in a fight. So because of that, because Dustin Poirier is pretty much relatively ready to rock right now, that might be the only reason he got ahead of Justin Gage. It wasn't me dismissing Justin Gage as a contender. The man deserves it 100%. Uh, but Islam wants to fight Leon Edwards, of course. Of course, that would be a monumentous occasion. Of course, he wants to be a two-weight division champion, and he probably looks at him as an opponent that he thinks he can use his wrestling in and be advantageous. Um, but, yeah, I mean, what more is there to say? So it seems like Islam really wants to get two fights in this year. Like, it seems like he really wants one over the summer. And then you have to assume at this point every year he's going to be on the Abu Dhabi card if they go back, which... Uh, like we all kind of have that like in our minds for how the scheduling is going to work. So it's like it, I'm looking at UFC 303, uh, June 29th, and that seems one where it's like circle that. If Justin Gaethje gets out of this Max Holloway fight and he thinks he's going to be ready to go by the end of June, then yes, of course, Justin should get the next shot. But if he's not, I I guarantee Dustin Poirier would be ready yeah. to show up by June 29th for that fight. Well, be careful because Gagey will come for you and accuse you of talking bollocks. That's all I was saying. Like, Gagey knocked out Dustin Poirier. Of course, of course he deserves it more, you know, but for all the reasons we just said, maybe it doesn't happen. Either way, I would like to see either of them fight Islam Makachev. You know, it'd be interesting. Yeah, they both lost to Habib. Islam isn't Habib. He's a very, very similar fighter. In fact, he might even be more effective. He might even have better striking and he might even eventually go down and have that resume. I think a better question, a better discussion point is this. Let's just assume, and this is a hard assumption, but let's assume that Islam Makachev wins his next five fights, which isn't hard as the champion, but he's got that one loss on his record. Would he be more highly regarded than Habib? who retired at 29-0, and 0, but only really took on the elite competition for his last few fights. Again, no disrespect to Habib. But I said that before. I said that's why I used to have John Jones above Habib because Habib, what did he do? He did Dustin, Justin, Connor. Before that, it was kind of like people like Michael Johnson and stuff, which again, great yeah. fighters, great, oh, both, great yeah. fighters, you know, but, but not the top of the food chain. Won the whereas belt Islam now Quinta. won the belt of Ali Quinta. Uh, whereas now Islam is beating Volk twice. He's beating Charles Oliveira. You know, and there's there's other great wins on there as well. If he can go on another massive stretch and become a two weight division champion to beat Dustin, Justin, Oliveira, Saruki, and all those people and go through every bloody goddamn contender, would he have a bigger legacy than Habib? Or does the fact that Habib was undetired, uh, un, undefeated trump the opponents? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to UFC longevity at that point, right? So uh, Khabib had, he only had 12 fights in the UFC, right? I think Islam has got to be past that by now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, because he was he was a contender on the rise with a pretty long unbeaten streak for, for quite some time there. So um you know already like the 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 cage time accrued is greater for islam if he gets wins over dustin and justin uh that means that they've defended against you know two of the same people um and, and if you do add in that Oliveira, who was probably the next best guy who next in line for khabib you know when when he did retire I, it's it really is tough to to make an argument yeah but the thing is that one loss man and it was a knockout loss as well it's it is that probably eats away at the soul. Okay, Adriano who Martins. Who's Adriano Martins? Do you know what I mean? Just goes to show one shot can change everything early in the fight as well. You know, do you think who, who would be the guy to beat Islam Makachev? Because it could be just engaging, right? It could be Dustin Poirier, but unlikely given the fights with Khabib. Do you know who I think? Do you know who I think probably has the best chance? And again, this is no disrespect to Justin or Dustin. They could go out there, they could knock him out. I just said Adriano Martins was able to do that. We're all human beings. Anything's possible. But if I was to look at skill sets on paper, Armin Sarukian. Yeah. And I think he beat, he fought, he fought Islam before. 
but I think it was on relatively short notice. I, and I given believe the improved... it was... Go on. I believe it was Sarukian's like debut in the UFC as well. So it was one of yeah. those things where he was just a guy who was around, and that's how he got into the UFC was by facing a killer like Islam on like two weeks' notice. Yeah, yeah. Islam on two weeks' notice, went to a decision with him, but then since then he has got so much better. I mean, look at that fight against Benil Dariush. Unbelievable. And who's he fighting? Who's he fighting? Oliveira. Oliveira. Yeah, yeah. It's a fun time to be an MMA fan, certainly if you like the lightweights. Anyway, should we do some questions? Thank you for supporting the show. But please, send in some video questions. Make it interactive. Give us some fun stuff. Send it into bympod at gmail.com. And if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts, make sure to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating, positive review. It really helps out on those platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you hit that notification bell to find out whenever a new episode drops. And if you want to catch over 500 episodes you can't find anywhere else completely ad-free, totally uncensored, head to gasdigital.com. Use the promo code BYM14. Get a two-week free trial. Check it out. We're 20 great shows on the network. All right, guys. First question we got here today is from Mr. Ryan Yorkston. Ryan Yorkston. Hey, BYM Pod. Ryan here from sunny Scotland. A question for Michael and Anthony. Just curious as to what your thoughts on the point of weight classes and what I mean is really look at when you look at people like Paulo Costa, he fights in the 185 pound division, but when he gets in the octagon, he's 215 pounds. Now he's only actually at that middle weight limit for probably about five minutes on Friday afternoon when he's weighing in. So what's the point of the weigh in if say Paolo Costa's 215 pounds but Robert Whitaker might only be 190, 200 pounds so I don't really understand that but maybe you guys will be able to tell me better. Love the podcast thank you. Well thank you very much and look listen I understand what you're saying but the reality is 24 hours before the fight or 36 hours whatever the case may be you agree to be a certain weight, okay? And that's up to the fighter then individually what they want to do to get to that weight. Some fighters want to cut a lot of weight. Some fighters want to be more to their natural weight. And there's always a give and a take. You know what I'm saying? So the people that cut a lot of weight, like Paolo Costa, and then go back into the octagon afterwards, that, that allows them the advantage of being bigger and stronger, but it also comes with a price. You're going to get tired quicker. You're going to, um, throughout the training camp, by the way, as well, you're going to probably be running at a calorie deficiency because, you know, you're trying to slim down and make weight. You're also not going to have the ability to take a punch as well. It's as simple as that. Al Jermaine Sterling said it recently. I know for when I've cut weight, I didn't take shots very well. A lot of the time, when you cut an incredible amount of water weight, it affects your ability to take a punch. However, you're going to be bigger, you're going to be stronger, and earlier in the fight, you're definitely going to be in an advantage. The smaller guy that hasn't gone through those weight cuts, his cardio is going to be better. He's not sacrificing himself in training camp. He's, he's, he's having all the nutrients, the carbohydrates, everything that he needs to fuel his body and also to recover from the training sessions as well. So there's a give and a take, you know. In the earlier parts of the fight, he'll have an advantage for sure. You know, but as the fight progresses, he's going to slow down, he's going to get tired, and he's not going to be able to take a punch as well. Ultimately, it's down to you. If you can make the weight, then make the weight, and there's there's no issue. However, you want to go about making that weight, that's down to the fighter. That's down to the fighter. Because think about it like this: even guys that don't necessarily cut weight, they'll probably still be cutting a little bit of weight in the morning of. But by the time they get into the octagon, they're not that way. They have to have a weigh-in at some point. You know what I mean? Now you could say, let's do weigh-ins on the day of the fight. You know, but it just, it comes from the boxing world. You know, it's always kind of been like that in professional combat sports. You have the weigh-in the day before. And, and that's just the way it always is. Like if you look at boxing, for example, they don't have the history of cutting weight like mixed martial artists. And that kind of, that trend comes from the wrestling world. Wrestlers have often cut a lot of weight for those reasons. Now, wrestling's a much uh, shorter sport. Yeah, I think three two-minute rounds, if I'm not mistaken. So they don't feel that quite as much. However, wrestling is a ridiculously intense sport as well. So there's a give and a take, you know, but it all depends on the individual of how what kind of sacrifice they want to go through to get to that weight. 
So what do you think about like something like California that'll like come in and, and, you know, suspend fighters or or I'm not sure if they find fighters that that, where it's like over, if you're gaining back over it's 10 or 20% of your total body weight uh, between, you know, the, the weigh-ins and fight day, there is like a penalty there. Like, do you think that should be a wider thing or, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, for a while that they were going to bring in a a rule where, I think it was going to be across the border. I think even California brought it in for a while, but somehow it kind of drifted off. But I think it kind of just came back in recently. Yeah, they have it. It's always been a thing because I know I think Costa was on the the, the yeah. card at the forum, and they they got him for that for sure. We find him. I'm not sure if it was a fine or if it was like a mandatory suspension. Uh, let me let me take a, a look at that. Yeah, I don't understand the mandatory suspension. The mandatory suspension, if it's going to be pre- preventative, would not allow him to compete. He's guess, still going into the fight and he's still winning because of it, even though he lost. I'm saying if you still went through that and you were able to win the fight, afterwards you, you're going to take a few months off anyway. So that doesn't achieve anything. Uh, I'm not against it, though. I, I am not against a limitation on the amount of weight that you can cut. But just like with steroids, steroids aren't allowed. People are always going to try and find a way to cut corners. They're going to find a way to cheat. You know what I mean? So. This will be trying to fix a problem that most of the fighters don't have an issue with anyway. You know, because as I say, there's a give and a take to it. And it's like for me, when I lost against Rashad Evans, I was like, okay, I'm not making the sacrifices that I need to to be the best fighter that I can. Rashad Evans was killing himself in the sauna. I was drinking seven up and eating Chinese noodles, you know, eating noodles in a Chinese restaurant. You know what I'm saying? And then afterwards I thought, right, maybe I'm in the wrong weight class. You know, as if you can't beat them, join them. Next fight, I'm in a sauna suit, hating life and cutting weight, and I absolutely hated it. Do you know what I mean? But I was able, and I thought I would be fighting smaller guys. (laughs) But then the opponents, I remember I saw Jason Day, he was my second fight at middleweight, and I was like, I was looking up at him, like, holy shit. (laughs) You're supposed to be small. (laughs) The hell is going on? So, yeah, you know, what did you find? Uh, so yeah, I looked it up. Uh, so California State Athletic Commission has in the past given temporary suspensions. They've also recommended, uh, like they that was a thing they did for a time where they gave strong recommendations that a fighter move from like weight class X to weight class Y, like uh, up a weight class. Uh, but for this last one, I think it was like six or seven fighters were over the 15% limit. So likely no real penalties coming from UFC 298. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of my point. You know what I mean? They put these kind of guidelines in place but you generally aren't going to turn around and fight a month later anyway. So it's kind of, you know, it's not really achieving much. It's down to the fighter. Anyway, good question. Thank you very much, Brian. All right. So next question we have is from Gabriel Paz, and you guys gave him a roasting last time. What's up, guys? It's Gabe from Memphis, Tennessee again, back with another question after you guys violated me the first time, just roasted me into oblivion. I've forgiven you, you know, because I realized I'm the one with two eyes and a full head of hair. Maybe I'm winning. Regardless, though, my question today is about the MMA guru. What do you guys think of him? I think he's hilarious. I think he's really just a reaction to the worst forms of MMA media we've seen at official UFC events that ask the most boring questions ever, sound like they're wrote by chat GPT. And I imagine it's boring for you guys to be asked the questions. It's definitely boring for us to watch as fans. So we turn to people like the guru to, you know, deliver some entertainment about UFC media and UFC news. What do you guys think of them? Right before I head out, just want to let you know, I'll be going to UFC 300 live and in person. First ever event. Empty my bank account for it. I'm basically flying there on a tin can with wings, sleeping in a homeless encampment just so I could afford the tickets. But I'm leaving for the military soon. Thought I might as well have some fun. If you guys will be there. Would love to grab a picture real quick. And Harrington, before I head out, you didn't respond to my call last time. It's okay. The offer is still there. I'm a patient man. You still have some more time to not be a coward. Love it all. It's jokes, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One eye and a full head of hair. Two eyes and a full head of hair. And this guy wants, what did he want? He wanted some kind of picture with me? Jesus Christ, Harrington, you're on mute again. He was probably going to ask you for a face-off, knowing that that guy. Yeah, yeah, I don't do them. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for the question, buddy. Um, the MMA guru. <laughs> Look, listen, I understand kind of what he said there. I must admit, some of the questions from the media, because I listen to all the media days uh, for research, you know, there is some boring questions. There is some boring questions. And, you know, 
You get your moment, you get your chance. Ask a bloody interesting question for crying out loud. Um, so I understand his point and what he's saying there. The MMA guru just talks shit about everybody. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I don't think he's he's out there um, doing an incredible media job. He's, he's doing his his thing. He's running his YouTube channel and he's, he's getting people to watch it. And, and he just talks shit about people because uh, that, that sells. That said, he's an entertaining guy. He's good at what he does. Uh, you know, he did a, a video a while ago. Michael Bisping is too retarded to be a UFC commentator. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually responded and I just said, well, it seems like I really get under your skin. I said, well, strap yourself in because I just signed a new four-year deal. Uh, but uh, some of his stuff's all right. I saw him doing an impression recently of Mark Goddard uh, being um, interviewed or something by Cartman from South Park. And I got to say, I did laugh. And so I left a comment and said, that's actually hilarious. Because uh, it was, it was funny. It was good. But hey, look, listen, negativity sells. Negativity sells. You know, if there's a video or a news article or whatever the case may be where people are talking about how much of an asshole, how much of a dickhead, how much this guy doesn't belong and all the rest of it, people are more inclined for whatever reason. We want to hear that. We want to hear a little controversy. We want to hear about how terrible somebody is, as opposed to somebody saying, this guy's incredible and leaving a raving review. For some reason, and I don't know why this is, and I'm sure a psychologist will be able to break it down, but I ain't no psychologist. Human beings seem to be more attractive, attracted, pardon me, to hearing about negativity than what they want to hear about positivity. You know what I mean? They want to, maybe it's because they can't do the things that the fighter, that the actor, that the TV host or the sportsman or whatever the case may be is doing. They can't do it, so they want to hear someone talk shit about them. I don't think that's necessarily the case, though, because people are fans of them in the first place. Maybe it humanizes them. I'm not sure what it is. So he likes to talk shit about a lot of people. Sometimes it's warranted. Sometimes it's unnecessary. Hey, But, hey, fair play to him. He's doing his thing. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's my thoughts on the MMA guru. Bro, I mean, I have somebody who is, I've offered to fight this guy. Like, I, hates him. He's <laughs> really, really down under my skin a couple of times. Yeah, and he's he's made a couple of videos about me, and I'm nobody. So it's like, if you've sunk to the level of making videos about me, it's pretty bad out there. But I do, I think he's kind of funny. Um, and, and Hold on, funny. hold on, hold on. Listen, Harold, no offense, buddy. No offense. No offense. I reckon the MMA guru would smash you. Yo, bro, I he's gigantic. Right Listen, he's a, he's a, he's chubby, he's fat, but he's a big dude. He's like he's six five old. or something like that. He's a big old I mean? teddy bear. He's, he's giant. Not a, he's not a professional fighter, but neither is you, Harry. Too. Yeah. and he's got I'm the size saying, advantage. I called him out for a fight, and this guy who's so much bigger and tougher than me said, "Oh no, I'm not fighting until I get on a Misfits card." Anyway. Let me go not hug KSI a little bit more, dude. Get out of here. Oh, I will man. say, I will say, <laughs> he broke the he broke the Ian Gary story. The Ian Gary wag thing, that all came from, this whole thing came from MMA Guru. So, dude, thank you for, like, four months worth of content uh, across every different, yeah, you know, yeah, across yeah. everybody's MMA show. He's doing he's great always work. Saying, he's always saying that he's going to mog me, whatever mog means. What is this slang term? He's going to mog me? I thought it was a British thing. I thought like well, maybe it is, but I'm not familiar with it. I've lived here for 13 years now. Do you know what I mean? Uh, if if Mog means he's gonna beat me up, <laughs> check yourself before you wreck yourself. Do you know what I mean, bro? Just because you're tall and you're a bit overweight, don't mean shit, bro. Um, Ooh, uh, a term on. popularized by modern day aesthetic bodybuilders, meaning outsizing or dwarfing somebody in muscle size, oh. fullness, and definition. So he's just well, got a strong man he next to the you. Muscle size. He hasn't got the definition. He's got, got, the flab. <laughs> he's got the flab and he's got the bad hair and he's probably got the, the, the greasy skin and the body odor. They're probably the, the, the main things he could outdo <laughs> me in. But fair play to him. Fair play to him. I, as I say, you know, he's doing his thing. He, he's talking shit, whatever. He's having a laugh. Oh, I think he's funny. Okay. Yeah, no, no. As I say, I thought he yeah. was talk, but then I've seen some of his stuff, and he did make me chuckle. Do you know what I mean? So, hey, fair play, fair play. So, speaking of the wag thing, uh, we have a question here from Abby from Fight Space. Oh, she's back. 
What up, Abby? What's up, BYM Pod? It's me, Abby, once again. And my question for the boys today, especially to the king of trash talk himself, Mr. DJ Mikey B, is I want to get your reactions to Ian Gary's clap back at Colby Covington for all of the things that he said about Layla and the whole situation there in the lead up to their potential matchup in the future. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Give me your reactions. And I also want to give a quick shout out to my boy, Will Esparza over at House of Dragons International. He's that boy and he's hoping Whoa. to get a fight soon. We're not running a cameo service. That's the question, frankly. <laughs> but then again, you were doing great. You were doing fantastic, starting with a compliment. But then you had to, and I also want to give a shout out to, no, no, fight queen, <laughs> stop it. Right? You've been demoted. You are not a fight queen. You are a, not a fight princess. You are a fight. A, a duchess? Uh, I don't know what's lower down. Lady in waiting. You're a fight whore. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have the video of Ian Gary's response? That'd be good oh, to yeah. provide some context, Brian, if you can find that real quick. So, as we know, the last episode, we went through it all. I'll talk. I'll fill, Brian. That's what I'm doing. Just a heads up. Um, Colby came out, went nuclear, right? Talked about his wife again, right? He's, he's doing it over and over and over. I said, look, listen, he should come out and say, yeah, I want to fight you. Simple as that. Essentially, Ian Gary came out. He responded and said, yeah, I've got an ultimatum for you, right? We'll fight in an I quit challenge or something like that. If the first one to say I quit has to leave the UFC for good. Listen here, Kobe Chaos Covington. You are in no position to tell me what I should be doing in life. You'll do as you're told. And kill! And kill! And kill! You gave me three stipulations, all of which had nothing to do about fighting, but we're all talking about my wife. Layla, 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 get on your hands and knees and beg. I don't know how you were raised, but women aren't property, and my wife definitely ain't no trophy. You should be focusing on me. I'm the one who's in that octagon with you. I'm the one who's going to punch a hole in your head. So stop swerving me and keep Layla's name out your mouth. How many of you guys have Gary's wife? You're not America's favorite fighter. What you are is a peak underperformer. You're the only person in UFC history to lose three world title fights. And you haven't got a single win against anybody in the top 15 right now. So, Kobe, why should I fight you? I can think of one reason. I challenge you to an I quit match where one of us has to say, I quit. Oh, ah, 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 I quit! I quit! I quit! And whoever says the words I quit has to retire. Gloves off, sent through the octagon, sayonara, my friend. I'm going to be the final chapter in your legacy of failure. I am going to rid the UFC of Kobe Covington for good. And I'm going to make MMA great again. Mm, yeah, so look, listen, I'm not going to stand there and criticize him. I was, I'm just going to say what I would have said, which is essentially what I did do last week. But he's skirting around the subject there. He's saying, okay, let's do a I quit thing. Whoever loses leaves the UFC for good. They never work. They're never adhered to. You don't see somebody go, okay, well, that's it. I lost and I'm a man of my word, guys. You know what I mean? Um, I would not have been able to have the composure to put that video together and say, right, here's what we'll do. We'll do this and we'll edit it up and sell the rest of it. I just said, yeah, you prick. Oh, 100%. You want to fight? Well, we're going to fight, buddy. We're going to fight. I've called the UFC. Simple as that. I've called the UFC. I accept your challenge, dickhead. It's on. It is on, man. I'm going to smash you to pieces. And then there's a good opportunity. There's a good potential that I come and smash it in the hotel room afterwards. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, I might smash you at the weigh-ins <laughs> and I'm probably going to punch your head in every day I see you for the rest of my life. At this point here, I am reminded from the of the Joe Pesci scene in Goodfellas. He says, you got my money? He says, no, no, no. And he says, well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask for my money. If you haven't got it, I'm going to smash your freaking face in. I'm going to put you in a coma. And just about the time you're coming out of a coma, I'll just be getting out of prison. And you know what I'll do? I'll smash your face in again because I'm stupid and I don't give up. And that's my business. And that's how I roll or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Dude, he's gone nuclear on your wife. Do you know what I mean? That's why he's saying her name to get that response, you know, and it, it's, it's nasty. 
it's below the belt. It should be off the table, you know. Uh, trying to make the comeback somewhat entertaining and comical wouldn't have been my path. But hey, fair play. Sounds like he wants to fight him regardless. And that's that. That's number one. Now, you could argue that Colby Covington's won, that he's got his way. Because there could be some people out there that might say, if I'm Ian Gary, I wouldn't give him what he wants. You know, but no, no, no. You want to get your hands on him. And, you know, obviously I'm joking about the hotel and all the rest of it. I'm joking about that. But, but you know, they're, they're, they're very serious words that should have serious consequences. Unfortunately, you have a platform where you can both get paid a lot of money to actually fight and settle your differences. And it would actually make it way more entertaining for the fan base to watch. So all he's going to do is say, yeah, fine. Call Hunter, call Dana, call Sean Shelby, Mick Maynard, whoever there is, it is that he deals with personally and say, sort that fight. And obviously it's down to the UFC whether or not it makes sense for them. Maybe given all the negativity, you know, maybe they don't want to promote that fight. I, 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 I'm, I'm just throwing the ball around. I'm not saying they would say that, Harrington, that stupid look on your face, <laughs> that bemused look about you. Uh, I'm just saying that maybe they don't, you know, who knows? But they don't want ugliness. They don't. I know it sells, but they don't necessarily want that. They don't. They do everything they can to keep fighters like that away from each other at the hotels. You know, they do. They do. The UFC don't want that at all. But that is some pretty, pretty heavy stuff. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying this is the same company that used the footage of the dolly going through the window to promote pay-per-views for, for you know, the Khabib-McGregor fight. Well, and if I'm, you got it, you use it. I was going to say, what, what, what's, bit, what, what's done is done. That, and that's that was going to be my point. What's done is done here. Colby's already said what he said, right? Ian Gary has yeah, been yeah, entertaining yeah, yeah, but, but just it every count step of the way. Sorry to interrupt, but just to counter yeah. your point there, that doesn't mean they're not going to do everything they can to ensure that they don't run into each other beforehand. Oh, yeah. They're not they're not going to set that up and like, let's have the embedded guys ready for it to sell the fight. No, they will do everything in their power to make sure that they don't encounter one another. You know, and it, and if it's already in the bag and they've got the footage of Conor McGregor going mental with a with a dolly. You're a fight promoter. You're trying to promote the fight. That's great promotional footage, which resulted in the biggest pay-per-view of all time for the UFC. Right, but I'm saying they've already got their dolly through the window where Colby Covington is asking a room full of people if they banged Ian Gary's wife. And yeah. Ian Gary himself just shared that clip again, which makes know, absolutely no sense I know, to me. That's I know, crazy. I know, <laughs> he, I know. He's sitting in I a know. pool making making Timex ads. Literally, the, the the his first response was him sitting in a pool, like looking at his watch, saying, "I'll respond on my time." Hashtag the the company I'm selling watches for. You're not in the pocket. You're not in the moment. You're not worried about this guy disrespecting your wife. You're trying to put on some kind of show. The UFC already has all that footage, and it's going to be used. Yeah. I, <laughs> So they're gonna have to put them on the same press conference stage together. They're gonna have to do it at oh, some no, point I before those two fight. I, listen, you, you stated your case very well, and I concede <laughs> defeat in this one. You got me. You got me good. It had to happen at some point. How long have we been doing this podcast now? You know what I mean? Seven, eight years. Uh, I can retire yeah, now. Yeah. Oh, probably longer. <laughs> probably longer. Uh, it was eight years ago since I fought Anderson Silva. Eight years. Eight years. I was doing it then. I did an episode from my hotel room. So longer than eight, uh, maybe nine or nine, 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 <laughs> nine, 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 nine. Sound bloody German. Uh, that's the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for watching. Anthony Smith will not be back because it's Thursday. Uh, Thursday, we have Bo Nickel, we have Paolo Costa, and I think one other as well. So make sure you tune in for that one. Thanks for the support. See you soon.